Okay, welcome back to part two. As I said, there'll be two parts to this and a third in looking at the bigger picture of different studies. So this is the veggie component and I broke out the animal sources of nutrition from the veggie sources of nutrition just to use as an example between these two things. So this is all of the veggies that I selected from their particular list. You know, here's a tablespoon of olive oil, there was a fruit that they had suggested, a low glycemic fruit. There's the yellow bell pepper, raw for carotenoids, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, and the beets, the calories, Brussels sprouts. So all of this, we look over here, I said all of that is about 1260 carbs. So 1260 uh, sorry, calories per day, about uh, 46 grams, 47 grams of protein, 150 some on, 155 carbs and 65 grams of fat. So why would you care? A couple of these things. In the interview that um, Kara did with Dr. Perlmutter, she was hoping to get a sort of a ketogenic benefit of all this. It's like, there's no way there's gonna be a ketogenic benefit with 152 grams of veggies, plus what you got. Well, that's the carbs pretty much completely. So that's out of that. The classic ketogenic diet, as you know, is 20 grams of protein, uh, 20 grams of carbohydrates per day or less. So um, they missed that target, but that's interesting. And it's, they have good sources. We're gonna assume all that's organic, right? Because that's what they encouraged. So down to the omega-6-3 ratio here, look, it's almost a 26 to one ratio of all of the, the, the omega-6s versus the omega-3s. We've talked about that in previous videos a lot. So look at that at the omega-6, what I consider the omega-6 catastrophe. But what I wanted to point out here is that this is chronometer that when we look at omega-3, it's not EPA and DHA, it's ALA, it's alpha-linolenic uh, alpha acid, which is a very, very, very weak omega-3. And now it takes about 18 or 19 times as much of ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, as it would EPA or DHA. So it's fish oil, if you will, or pretty much the fats that you get from animal sources. There is some omega-6, uh, rachidonic acid in animal sources, no doubt, but not much. Um, I mean, yeah, there is arachidonic acid. There's not much in the way of omega-6. There's mostly DHA and EPA and some saturated fats as well. So that's a big difference in, in there. Uh, and that's a huge ratio of 26 to 1. You can argue, with, gosh, is all this correct from chronometer? It's more, nothing's perfect and nothing's 100% correct. I don't hold anybody to that requirement, uh, but it's pretty darn close. Let's look over here. We notice that we actually don't have much in the way of B12. This is true, and this is why vegetarians, those who are getting, they don't want to eat animal products, is that they will be B12 deficient and they will get macrocytic anemia. Done. They have uh, incomplete going down. And let me just pop back to compare to the animal meat. This is a ligger, uh, ligger, liver and egg component. And you can see, well, that's not 100% either. Well, they kind of complement each other if you want to look at it that way. And in terms of methyl donors, these are pretty much all methyl donors, certainly 12, 6, 2. Um, and you can argue the other thing, choline and folate. So look at folate in terms of animals. So we're saying we're a little shy, we're not getting 100%. And now let's go to the veggie component. We are getting over 100%. So they complement each other, which is really pretty nice. And I'm sure it was put together with that intention to have complete nutrition. Um, what else can I say here? I think that's uh, pretty tight. This is something you don't hear much about. It's the uh, calcium oxalate ratio. So when you're having a lot of these, especially collards, and the spinach, and the kale, and the chard, Swiss chard, they are very high in a thing called oxalates. Oxalates are what? Oxalates certainly are most famously associated with kidney stones. And um, apart from that, I believe that they are very detrimental. I mean, there's enough documentation that they are very detrimental for gut health. Um, that's one reason I shifted pretty much after being a multi-decade Neuro vegetarian to a um, carnivore side of thing, but that's just me and my trip wanting to get my health, not projecting it on other people. But this ratio of calcium to oxalates is huge when you are reliant on veggies and, sp and some veggies more than others. So we have 
Problem here with oxalates being a veggie, problem with B12 deficiency being um, a veggie uh, person, a vegetarian, as, as opposed to, given their limitations, by the way, um, there's very little in the way of oxalates. Here's two, right? So here is mostly calcium, very little oxalates, um, a low omega-6 to 3 ratio, much lower, I should say. Back here, we have uh, we're veggies. We have a 5 to 1, or I call it a 6 to 1 ratio, and a horrible ratio for omega-6 and 3. Interesting though, eh? So it's good to go through what's being recommended. So the last thing that they recommended, you saw that I added some olive oil in there. Well, they recommended, hey, have a balanced types of healthy oils. And the healthy oils that they recommended were coconut oil, olive oil, flaxseed oil, and pumpkin seed oil. These three have a very long history with humanity, back more than 10,000 years, well documented. Uh, pumpkin seed oil, not so much, but let's get into it. Let's look at the oils, just like we did the veggies and just like we did the animal source protein. Okay, pumpkin seed oil. What the heck is pumpkin seed oil? Pumpkin seed oil is primarily recommended due to a thing called carotenoids. If you think of pumpkins being pumpkin color, it's a color. All those colors are carotenoids. So your to red tomatoes, your yellow tomatoes, your, what are the colors we have? Blue tomatoes? We have peppers. Uh, these are nightshade family, by the way, but all the color, colorful veggies or carotenoids too famously are used for vision. And lack of, deficiency of, gives you age-related macular de degeneration, and they are uh, xanthine and zeaxanthine, um, famously. So now look at pumpkin seed oil. So it's, it's, it's more than just the fats, the reason I said that. It's also for the carotenoids, which is different than all the others. So what we have is, and the reason I box this in red is because pumpkin seed oil is at least 50% omega-6, linoleic acid, at least. So that's the same omega-6 that you got with soy oil, with, with um, corn oil, cottonseed oil, and so on and so forth. But it has other fats. It has oleic acid, which is what you get with olive oil, of course. It's most famously from olive oil. And also your body makes this. So none of these are essential. You could argue that this omega-6 is essential. Um, but if you're having animal meats, fats, omega, um, your omega-3 EPA, DHA is, is really the essential fat. And these can eventually be converted into that. So we have Cereic acid, saturated fat, palmitic acid. Palmitic acid is the highest concentration of fat in your body. If I was to take some serum right now, a little sample, throw it to the lab, on a normal human, healthy human, we would have that being the highest fat. So it's called palmitic because it comes from, it's called palmitic because it comes from palm oil, which was started in North Africa, which is now highly farmed in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, being the most famous and somewhat uh, in Central America as well. But you've heard about palm oil. That's what they're talking about. Palmitic acid is, anyway. Flaxseed oil, flaxseed oil is 50% omega-3 ALA. Remember I showed you that? It's a very weak omega-3, alpha linolenic acid. And the rest is a little oleic. See, we have oleic is 18%, and we have linoleic, which is uh, the omega-6, 15%, and a little bit of saturated fats. So they're all mixed, but, Flaxseed oil was perhaps overprescribed for a good 10 years from the 90s to the early 10, and then it transitioned into fish oil. And this is what you gave nearly everybody to try to balance their omega-3-6 ratios. Olive oil, which we know olive oil. Everybody knows olive oil. They probably all have it in their house right now. What is olive oil actually made up of? Well, it's 75%. It's 75% oleic acid. That's no surprise. It has uh, omega-6, it has some omega-3, and it has some palmitic and syric. So it's like they all have the same kind of fats, but they just have more of one than the other. Coconut oil, at a glance you'd say, oh, coconut oil is all saturated fats. Well, it's very highly saturated fats. That's what this little bar is here, down here. It's all saturated fats. These are all the different kinds of saturated fats. The interesting thing about coconut oil is caprylic acid 
triglyceride, um, immediately converts into a ketone, beta-hydroxybutyrate, BHB, uh, by the liver within 15 minutes of having it. So it's highly ketogenic. Uh, good oil to have. Uh, we have it around the house. Great oil to cook with. So now you get to see these oils all have their own story. They're not just all one thing or the other. Here's a summary. So pumpkin seed oil is primarily omega-6 and 30% oleic, just like olive oil, 20% saturated fats. Flaxseed oil is 50% omega-3. So these are just the opposite, right? In terms of plant-based a little omega-6, some oleic, which is olive oil, and some saturated fats. Olive oil is oleic, 75% oleic. These are heavy hitters down here, heavy oleic. Coconut oil is heavy saturated fats, nearly 100%. Okay, so when you put all this together in one reading, here's the liver, here's the veggies, there's the olive oil, uh, what do we get? So one thing I wanted to mention is that they don't say how tall these guys are. They don't have their, their BMIs or anything. They're just men between 50 and 72. So let's assume that they're the average height of a male in the United States. That happens to be me, 5'10". So I know that height pretty well. I'm actually a little, a little higher, a little taller. Um, and so I know that the basal metabolic rate for an average male is about that 1600 ballpark. If you work out, it's more. If you don't work out, it should be less. And you break this down. I also know what the required amount of protein is per person for a male of that height. And that would be 162 grams of protein. The older you get, you need more protein, but 162 grams. So they're way under for these two months, eight or nine weeks on their protein amount, which is interesting. Their carbs, we talked about that before. It's a 155. If you were to be ketogenic, you'd have to be 20 or less. And then your fat. So what else can we look at? Collectively, the omega-6-3 ratio is huge. It's 23 to 1. And what else do we have? We have saturated fats, omega-6. Of course, we said that was the dominant fat here, and omega-3. And over here, when you line up those together, you got a lot of green boxes. You made a lot of friends. Okay, so now to the supplements they took. Why did they take the supplements? Back for a step, they have plenty of whole food sources of methyl donors. They have plenty of whole food sources of methyl donors. So they have plenty of folate and they don't need, nor do they want, the folic acid. So that's a big deal. So they got a good, they got a good kind, if you will. Folate, not B12. So what they took for supplements now are two things that I showed you before. This is basically a serving of all these different veggies. So we have um, flaxseed powder, chia powder, quinoa, spout powder, veggie blend, whatever that is, spirulina, carrot, broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, parsley, bamboo, apple fruit, different berries, milk thistle, turmeric, blueberry, this is an herbal blend. Maybe that's just icy what they're talking about now. Okay, so they call this methylating adaptogens. They don't call these methyl donors methylating adaptogens. Why would that be uh, important? So they do two scoops a day of this phytonutrient drink. It's available on Wellevate, by the way, and there's a link in the description for because people are going to be asking, so I just hit that off. Uh, these are the macronutrients. I didn't add this into the, the total. Uh, it didn't change much. Just a little, some carbs, yes. Uh, the sugars are part of the carbs and one protein, and I believe it's 40 calories. There's your vitamin C, iron, sodium, etc. So methylating adaptogens, methylating adaptogens. What is very clever about this study is how they use this supplement. Coming to that in a second. Here's the other supplement. It's a probiotic with a very specific type, um, lactobacillus uh, plantarium, and uh, let's just say it's helpful without getting into the history or why they chose this particular. Frankly, I think they could have chosen a lot of different ones. This is their experiment. That's what they chose. <laughs> okay, end of that. This is also available on Wallabate for those who are going to go look for it. All right, two parts of this diet that might be brilliant, actually, and might be profoundly effective relative to whole food sources of methylating factors and methylating adaptogens. Okay, methylating factors, or we call them methyl donors. Those were 
This is all the methylating. They hit all these green boxes, methylating donors. So they go, they got that. They already have all the methylating factors. So they have a whole, the liver and the egg yolk, if you ask me. The liver and the egg yolk is like the heavy lifting. And I, I want to show you on chronometer what is really interesting to look at. So we're going to take a deeper look because you'll really appreciate where are these coming from. Right now, this is just a collective of everything we've talked about so far. Here we are on chronometer live, and this is that list of everything, the whole total kit and caboodle. These are all the, the numbers we've just talked about. What I want to show you is, let's say you go, so where is all that B12 coming from? And this lists, so I hit that, and now it lists, this is the major contributors of the B12, the calves liver, the hamburger, and the enhanced eggs. As I say, that's all animal sources. That's why as a vegetarian, you'd have a tough time. Now, let's say you want to find out where's all the saturated fats coming from. Here it lists from the biggest contributor to the smallest contributor. And you'll find that some saturated fats do come from, it's mostly animal, but they come from the, there's the sunflower, uh, sunflower seeds, the pumpkin squash seeds. And it's such a really insightful way of looking at what are my sources. Let's say you want to look at where's my protein coming from. So you hit that. Here's your protein. It's the hamburger. It's the sunflower seeds. It's the calves liver. There's some collar collards. Didn't know collards had 10 grams of protein per that particular serving. So it's such a great tool in my view to use something like this. So when we talk about methylating factors, it was all those things, all those B1, 2, 3, 4, there's no B4, uh, B5, B6, folic acid, which is B9, B12, those are considered methyl donors. So is the choline and a few other things. But the meth meth methyl adaptogens, that's a new thing. So what that is, think about this. We have a problem. They're defining aging as you're losing control of what you need to methylate, what cells, what cells, what genes you need to methylate and turn off, and what genes you need to not methylate and keep functioning. And once you start losing control, that's the opening the door to various diseases and just falling apart and eventually dying, right? This is the definition of aging that they're looking at, because if they can get a clear understanding of aging, then they think that pharmaceutically, this is all pharmaceutically driven, can come in and find something that will make it so we are more appropriate you know, we don't lose control of that methylating factor. So anyways, here we have the methyl, methylating factors or methyl donors, but in their protein, right in their protein, in their product right here, all these things, all these phytonutrients are the adaptogens. They're making, they're attempting to help with, no, reduce that 60% that weren't methylated that should have been methylated and reduce that 40% that were methylated that shouldn't have been methylated. So the adaptogens, the methylating adaptogens is a whole new concept, which is, I think, unique to previously. It's just been, well, make sure you have enough methyl donors. And um, I think whether that was planned or not, it makes this study I think somewhat brilliant in terms of using whole food sources. So these are, in essence, your methylating, for the most part, these are your methyl donors. We went through all that. And the liver and eggs, right? And there's the other veggie component. Now the methylating adapters were this. How profound. And this is about digestion. And so a lot of times people can have a good diet, but if they don't have the ability to digest things, what's the point? So it's not just you're eating a good diet, it's are you digesting, are you deriving nutrition from what you're eating, and that's why they put this in. They could have put in digestive enzymes and so on and so forth, but they put in one particular probiotic. Simple, to the point, and helpful, we're assuming. So was it luck or a well-planned study? Let's look. All right, so the results are, have you seen this before, of all of these 18 people, right, in the final analysis, all these people got younger and some got older. So. Wouldn't it be neat to have 18 is not a lot of people, and since we had a unlimited fund support from Metagenics, I would have loved to have seen more baseline lab work, which we'll get to later, to really be able to differentiate who are these people, and I would love to know, and there's plenty of companies could, for a couple hundred bucks, give a good genomic evaluation. Do we have some really problem gene people here? And maybe that was the issue, that they needed more, so there's that. So that would be two things that I would require. But what we're looking at, why 
yes, the majority benefited, period. We got that. They got younger epigenetically at the end of their eight and nine weeks. Could these results be due to addressing their nutrient deficiencies only? In other words, did they, did they all have all the same nutrient deficiencies because they're Americans and they eat kind of a deficient diet? Or did some have a more egregious amount. So what I use as a story, I say insert story of a person dying of thirst in the desert. So if you found somebody dying of thirst in the desert and you gave them water for an hour, for five hours, for a day, maybe for a week and got them back to at least being hydrated, that clearly was the right thing to do. Does that make water being a, a vital nutrient? Because you've definitely change that person's health span. They're about to die. They're about to stop their health span and stop their life. You now increase their health span to a long period of time. So it might speak more to the deficiency of the individual and their deficiencies as opposed to there's a universal plan out there for everybody that we can just all have this and we'll have those results. And so that's the question I ask. <clears throat> how general or how specific is this in in information? is this application. Clearly, very few people eat liver. I can speak to 20 years of seeing patients, no matter how many you tell them, they're just not going to eat liver. Well, they're going to have a problem. And if they don't eat a lot of eggs, there's another thing. So that's going to put them way up. And then if they eat processed foods, they're done. So you've addressed deficiencies. We don't know who had more, who had less, maybe who didn't have any. But so, so I say, what was their diet before the study compared to the diet in the study? Was it, by comparison, a more nutritionally, more nutritionally complete diet than it was what they had been doing pre previously? And then I said, all right, so let's say that's the case. Or is this exactly the point? Most of us are so nutrient deficient that improving our diet, addressing the deficiencies, we will reverse our aging. They will reverse their aging. And that's what we've got. I believe the population has become so nutrient deficient that we are like finding that person in the desert that is starving of thirst and giving them water. We're giving them nutrition that their body's been craving and hasn't gotten for the last 50 to 70 years because we've transitioned into processed foods and garbage. So this is miraculous. What this shows is having a nutritionally good diet, well-planned diet, will change your methylating, we'll call it ratio, of methylating ones that should be methylated and others that should not be methylated, and it's a natural process of aging. Will this be able to, if you measured and they were all nutritionally satisfactory and you gave them this diet, would it improve it anymore? Who knows? These are a lot of questions. Good studies initiate good questions. And it goes on to another study and another study. So it does put down the next piece of pavement that you can go forward with and saying, you know, this is what we found. I think the door just got opened. So I'm saying, meaning increasing their health span by setting their epigenetic clock back. Is that what happens when you fulfill your nutrient deficiencies? I tend to think so. Here's another way of looking at it. The effect of addressing nutrient deficiencies, here's epigenetic age, right? And here's chronologic age. So if you have no deficiencies, this is just like you saw this from the athletic one, no deficiencies, some deficiencies, very deficient. And it's like well-trained, somewhat trained, and sedentary. So you have the same situation, but this time what we're measuring is their degree of epigenetic age. The same thing, another way of measuring it. So we can turn that clock back just like the person with a higher VO2 max from exercising, being a athlete at 80, had a cardiovascular equivalent of somebody at 50. Somebody at 50 who is well-trained, as we tried to show here, not exactly 50, that's more like 55, at 55 was equivalent to somebody at 20 who didn't train at all. Remarkable. So too is a healthy, balanced, nutritional diet on a per person basis. So it's not the same diet for everybody. There's a little bit of individuality there as represented in their results, as represented in their results. Why did these people actually get older? This person was, let's say it was 48. And when they finished, they were 20 years older. That's a bit of a bummer, <laughs> you know?
<laughs> okay, then. So questions that remain for me, what was their diet like starting prior to starting their diet? What was their genome analysis? What mutations did they have that, that could have influenced their specific results? So coming up for the third part of this review is we're going to look at the lab uh, work results. And it wasn't a lot of labs, but it was interesting. Um, we're going to look at two other studies that were like this. They chose a different way of d looking at the methylating clock and the DMA, a a DNAMH clock, the methylation and everything. We're going to look at one's genome and how it relates to this study and how to use this as actionable information in your life. So it's just not an interesting little um, mental tour you took, but that there is something to this and you understand why some of the issues we've talked about are so really important because this is talking about, can we define aging? Because if we can define aging in this particular way, we can then collect in a very well precise documented way, things we can do to be healthier, if you will, minimize aging or becoming aging, becoming younger is becoming healthier. I always did say, if you, Act immature long enough, soon you will be. And now it's proving to be correct. Okay? Till next time.